I am presenting Union Gospel Press's Sunday School Lesson Number 8, Sunday, July 21st, 2024. The lesson is entitled, The Deliverance of the Jews. Lesson text comes from Esther, chapter 8, verses 3 through 8, and chapter 9, verses 18 through 23. Related scriptures are Esther, chapter 5, verses 1 through chapter 7, verse 10, chapter 8, verse 15 through chapter 9, verse 16, Psalms 106, verses 1 through 5, and 44 through 48. The place is Shushan. The time is 473 to 474 BC. Our lesson this week looks at celebration among the Jews. Queen Esther's courage had ushered in a time of great joy. Today's aim, facts, to show that God used Esther to transform the life of his people. Principle, to illustrate that celebration in the Christian life comes only when we have first made the sacrifices. Application, to prod believers to celebrate the victory they have in Christ. Illustrating the lesson. The celebration of our victory becomes more meaningful when we consider the suffering that preceded it. The resurrection came only after the cross. Practical point. One, fervent intercession, even before human authorities, is often needed to avert evils in the world. Esther 8, 3 through 4. Two, we should express our requests to authorities both passionately and specifically, verses 5 through 6. 3. Even when an evil cannot be undone, measures for mitigating it or working around it are almost always possible, verses 7 through 8. 4. It is good to set aside times to remember when we have experienced deliverance from evil or danger. Chapter 9, verses 18 through 19. 5. Good leaders will make sure that significant events in the life of their people are commemorated in the future. Verses 20 through 22. 6. We should finish those tasks we have set out to accomplish and follow the instructions of spiritual leaders. Verse 23, golden text. Therefore, the Jews of the villages that dwelt in the unwalled towns made the 14th day of the month Adar, a day of gladness and feasting, and a good day, and of sending portions one to another, Esther 9, 19. Today we have two lesson outlines. The first is Esther's petition, Esther 8, 3 through 8. The second is the Jews' joy, Esther 9, 18 through 23. Introduction. Our lesson begins with the Jews' very existence being threatened by their enemies. Esther needed to urge the king to stop the oncoming slaughter of her people, for she had been raised to her position for such a time as this, Esther 4.14. Her own life was at risk, however, for if she were to enter the king's presence uninvited, she could be, su she could be summarily executed. Bravely, bravely she entered and the king extended his golden scepter, signifying that she was welcome to speak. A college singing group had its annual tour scheduled well in advance. One of its members, however, was told by a new boss at his work that he could not get the time off to tour. Everyone prayed for a change of heart. As the group loaded the vans, at the last minute, the key member arrived with permission from his boss to go on the tour. Esther's Petition, Esther 8, 3. And Esther spake yet again before the king and fell down at his feet and besought him with tears to put away the mischief of Haman the Agagite and his device that he had devised against the Jews. Verse 4. Then the king held out the golden scepter toward Esther. So Esther arose and stood before the king. Verse 5. And said, 
if it please the king and if I have found favor in his sight and the thing seem right before the king and I be pleasing in his eyes, let it be written to reverse the letters devised by Haman, the son of Hymetatha, the Agagite, which he wrote to destroy the Jews, which are in all the king's provinces. Verse 6. For how can I endure to see evil that shall come unto my people? Or how can I endure to see the destruction of my kindred? Verse 7. Then... The king Azararus said unto Esther the queen and to Mordecai the Jew, Behold, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and him they have hanged upon the gallows because he laid his hand upon the Jews. Verse 8. Write ye also for the Jews as it liketh you in the king's name and seal it with the king's ring for the writing which is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's ring may no man reverse appearance esther 8 3 through 4 this was esther's second appearance before king hazarus this is the persian king otherwise known as azerces without being invited Previously, when asked by the king what she wanted, she had invited him and Haman to a dinner. At the dinner, the king asked again what she wanted, and she invited the two to a second banquet, promising to share her request at that time. We might wonder why the delay until we read what took place between those two dinners. In that span of time, Haman made special plans to kill Mordecai by hanging him on the gallows, chapter 5. Also during that time, King Hazarerus had a bad case of insomnia the night before Haman was going to request permission to have Mordecai killed. Once again, the sovereign hand of God was present. For during the king's insomnia, he had some historical records read and found out that Mordecai had once saved his life. When he asked how Mordecai had been rewarded, the king was told that nothing had ever been done for him. Upon Haman's arrival, the king asked him what could be done to honor someone the king wanted honored. Chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. Pride led Haman to wrongfully assume he was the one the king wanted to honor. It was only after he had detailed a grand plan that he found out that the honoree was the hated Mordecai. When the king told Haman to do the honoring, he experienced a dramatic reversal of fortunes, verses 7 through 11. It is clear that these events saved Mordecai from death. During Esther's delay in presenting her request, God had induced the king's insomnia and put all the details for the Jews' salvation in place. Esther soon exposed Haman's plot, and he was hanged on the gallows he prepared for Mordecai, chapter 7. The problem was that Haman's decree against the Jews, chapter 3, verses 13 through 14, was still in effect and would be carried out unless something could be done to stop it. For the Jew was, for the law was irrevocable. Thus, we find Esther again in the presence of the king pleading for her people. She approached the throne in tears, fell at the king's feet, and begged for his help. He again extended the scepter, allowing her to stand and present her request. Appeal, Esther 8, 5 through 6. By this time, Esther was given more respected by the king than previously, and Mordecai had been advanced in his kingdom. Nevertheless, none of this nullified the decree Haman had sealed with the signet ring of the king, chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. We understand the irrevocability of the decree from a statement in the book of Daniel. When Daniel's enemies wanted to get rid of him, they went to King Darius and suggested he establish a law that would force everyone to forego petitions to any gods other than the king. 
They concluded their request by saying, Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Daniel 6, 8. In verses 12 and 15, the same principle is mentioned again. A sealed Persian law could not be altered or annulled. It had to be carried out, and there was no possible exception available. For Esther, Mordecai, and the Jews in Hazarerus' kingdom, there was no hope of having Haman's decree overwritten. Esther and Mordecai understood that Haman's edict could not be overturned, but she seemed to have no other choice but to ask the king to protect her people from genocide. Esther couched her request in reminders that the king had a moral sense of right and wrong and that he had good feelings toward her. Notice these phrases. If it please the king, and if I have found favor in his sight, and the thing seem right before the king, and I be pleasing in his eyes, Esther 8, 5. She then specifically requested that the king override in writing the decree established by Haman to kill the Jews. Esther then ended her plea with a statement filled with emotion. How can I endure to see the evil that shall come unto my people? Or how can I endure to see the destruction of my kindred? Verse 6. It is important to realize, however, that Esther did not rely on emotions alone. She had tactfully referred to the decree as Haman's rather than the king's revealing some diplomatic abilities. At the same time, the king could not help seeing the hurt in her heart as she poured herself out on behalf of her people. Answer, Esther 8, 7 through 8. When Haman had been revealed as the one who had plotted the destruction of Esther's people, the king had become furious, 7, 7. As soon as he was told about the gallows prepared for Mordecai, he ordered Haman to be hanged on it instead, verses 9 through 10. When Esther disclosed her relationship with Mordecai, he gave Mordecai all the authority Haman had possessed. He gave Esther all of Haman's property, and she put Mordecai in charge of it, chapter 8, verses 1 through 2. In his response... Hazarerus reminded Esther of this change. At some point, Mordecai had been called into the presence of the king to meet with him and Esther, for both were addressed at this time. The king reviewed the facts, noting that Haman's property had been given to Esther and that Haman had been executed for plotting the genocide of the Jews. So far, this was nothing new and it did not directly address what Esther had requested, verse 7. What the king was telling them, though, was that Mordecai now had the same power Haman had once had and could use it to his own advantage. The initial decree could not be revoked, but another could be written to offset it. He then gave them permission not only to write whatever decree they wanted, but also to do it in his name and seal it with his signet ring, which he had already given to Mordecai 8.2. Mordecai already had the permission, but the king was reminding him that he could now feel free to use this new authority. In following this procedure, Mordecai would also have an effective decree that could not be changed or revoked. He proceeded to have a decree written that would allow the Jews to gather together to defend themselves against the attacks of the Persians, verse, eight, verse 11. They were specifically told they could annihilate any forces that attacked them. They did not have to spare any women or children, and they could plunder the possessions of the Persians. Copies of the decree were immediately sent to all the provinces. The Jews' Joy, verse 9, chapter 18. But the Jews that were at Shushan assembled together on the thirteenth day, therefore, 
and on the fourteenth thereof, and on the fifteenth day of the same they rested, and made it a day of feasting and gladness. Verse 19. Therefore the Jews of the villages that dwelled in the unwalled towns made the fourteenth day of the month Adar, a day of gladness and feasting, and a good day, and of sending portions one to another. Verse 20. And Mordecai wrote these things and sent letters unto all the Jews that were in all the provinces of the king Hazarerus, both nigh and far, verse 21, to establish this among them, that they should keep the 14th day of the month Adar and the 15th day of the same yearly, verse 22. As the days wherein the Jews rested from their enemies and the month which was turned unto them from sorrow to joy and from mourning into a good day, at that they should make them days of feasting and joy and of sending portions one to another and gifts to the poor. Verse 23, and the Jews undertook to do as they had begun and as Mordecai had written unto them. Celebration, Esther, chapter 9, verses 18 through 19. The day finally came for Haman's decree to be carried out. The forces that had hoped for great success in getting rid of the Jews, verse 1, met determined opposition and great defeat. Throughout the entire empire, the Jews gathered together and successfully defended themselves to the point that they were soon mightily feared, verse 2. In a completely surprising turn of events, the governmental officials sided with the Jews and helped them in their defense, verse, thir verse 3. That day, 500 Persian men in Shushan died, along with the ten sons of Haman, verse 12. The king then asked Esther whether she had any further desires, promising to grant them to her. God had so completely changed the circumstances of the Jewish people who had feared being annihilated that they now had a significant advantage over their enemies. The Jews in Shushan hanged Haman's ten sons on gallows to deter others from persecuting the Jewish people. The 13th day of Adar was the original date of Haman's decree to be carried out. The king extended that time for the Jews in Shushan, allowing them to continue attacks on their enemies on the 14th day, but on the 15th they stopped. On that day they rested and spent the time in feasting and celebrating. Since it had been only in Shushan that the extension of the slaughter had been in effect, the rest of the Jews in the kingdom celebrated on the 14th day of the month. They felt so secure that even in unwalled villages, they celebrated. Psalms 35 reads, God's anger endureth but a moment. In his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. That psalm of praise reminds us that although sorrowful circumstances sometimes overtake us, it is good to know the hope of deliverance and the joy that follows. Communication, Esther 9, 20 through 21. Mordecai wrote a historical account of all that had taken place. He then sent letters to all the Jews in every province of the kingdom. Details of his, of his chronicle are not divulged, but we do know he told the Jews to establish both the 14th and 15th days of of the month of Adar as annual celebration days. This newly established Jewish feast became known as the Feast of Purim, named after the word for a lot cast to determine the onslaught of Haman's genocide of the Jews. See chapter 3 verses 5 through 7. And the letters were sent by post into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to cause to perish all Jews, both young and old, little children and women. In one day, even upon the 13th day of the, of the 12th month, which is the month Adar, and to take the spoil of them for prey, 313. The naming of the new feast was meant to be an ironic way of recalling Haman's actions. It was probably viewed as an evidence of the Jews' victory in spite of Haman's strong and evil determination. 
The Feast of Purim is not mentioned in the New Testament, although it is in the Old Testament apocryphal literature and by Je Josephus. It was celebrated locally, that is, wherever Jews lived. It was not one of the national feasts established in the law. There were no pilgrimage to Jerusalem associated with the feast. Today, Purim is still celebrated. Included in the celebration is a reading of the book of Esther. When Haman's name is read, the people hiss, boo, stamp their feet, and use noisemakers in attempt to drown out his name. Commemoration, Esther 9, 22 through 23. Mordecai explained further why he wanted this holiday. The 14th and 15th days of Adar had been days of rest from being pursued by their enemies. This was when their sorrow was turned into joy and their mourning became happiness. The feast was to, to celebrate God's goodness in working through a number of circumstances to deliver the Jews. Mordecai wanted it to be a time of feasting and joy, of exchanging gifts and giving to the poor. The response of the Jews was positive. They accepted that from then on this was to be a customary observance, verse 27. Verse 28 then adds that they were willing to see to it that all succeeding generations would also understand the importance of the time. Sometime after Mordecai's letters went out, Esther and Mordecai wrote another letter about the Feast of Purim, verse 29. This served to confirm their intentions to establish the feast. Verse 31 suggests that some amount of time was to be set aside for fasting and mourning. Reminders of trials and victories are very important. Esther's life should be an encouragement to all of God's children. In spite of the fact that God and prayer are not explicitly mentioned in this book, the evidence of his presence and sovereign work is clear throughout. Questions 1. What important events took place between Esther's two dinners? 2. Why did Esther make a second appearance before the king? 3. What was Esther's approach as she asked the king to change the decree established by Haman? 4. What was her concluding emotional appeal to the king? 5. Of what did King Hazarerus remind Esther and Mordecai? And what was he implying they could do? 6. What decree did Mordecai write? 7. What did the king grant Esther at the conclusion of the day on which the Jews defended themselves? 8. Why, what did Mordecai and Esther ask the Jews to establish? 9. What name ha was given to the feast celebrating the Jews' deliverance? 10. How does the faithfulness of God toward the Jews encourage you? This concludes the Sunday School lesson for Sunday, July 21st, 2024. Thank you for listening. God bless.